Okay, so this is Special Senses Part 4. We've talked about the outer um, covering of the eye. We've talked about the middle layer of the eyeball. Now we're going to talk about the inner layer. The inner layer of the eyeball is called the retina, also known as, of course, the or inner layer. Inter, really? Um, so the retina itself actually has two layers. It has the pigmented layer and it has the neuronal layer. So let's go back to our M&M. &M. We had the candy. We had the chocolate. We had the skin of the peanut. And we had the peanut itself, right? Okay, the pigmented layer is actually going to be, now remember, this is the retina. The pigmented layer of the retina is going to be this layer here closest to the middle layer, the choroid, okay? The neuronal layer is actually going to be here, closest to in your M&M &M where you would find the peanut, but in an eyeball, you would be right next to the chamber, the inner chamber of the eye. So let's talk about the neuronal layer. This is the neuronal layer. This is the pigmented layer. Let me erase for a second. Okay, pigmented layer. In the neuronal layer, you actually have three layers of cells. You've got some cells here. You've got some cells here in the middle, which you're going to see um, <clears throat> in a lot more detail in just a minute. And then you've got these specialized cells here. Okay. This layer of cells are the photoreceptors. Okay, these layers of cells are called the relay neurons, which I did not spell correctly, but just go with me on it. Okay, so why, um, why is it important that we know where these things lie? Well, one of the reasons is because we need to know um, how this works, how, how they can get signal and then send signal. When it comes to those photoreceptors, photo, by the way, means light, okay? So these are light receptors. We have two types, the rods and the cones. You'll notice that we have a ton more rods than we have cones. We have 120 million rods and we only have six to seven million cones. Um, that's because we are diurnal. We are awake when the sun is out. <clears throat> so the landmarks of the retina, you know how your doctor will take a light and look into your eye, shine it into your eye, tell you to look forward. When your doctor does that, He's actually looking for three really important landmarks. The macula, which basically is in the back of your eye where your lens focuses the light that is going into your eye. In the center of that, right there, okay, here's my macula, there's the pointer to it. Here's my fovea, there's my pointer to it. So the fovea centralis is dead center in the middle of the macula, and it actually has the highest number of photoreceptors. It is kind of the most sensitive part of our eye. So having the most photoreceptors there also means it is the greatest place of visual acuity. It is the best place that our eye can see something. On the opposite end of that is the optic disc. Again, you can see the, the little arrow pointing to it. The optic disc is also known as the blind spot. There are no photoreceptors 
in this part of your eye. In fact, it's the entrance for the arteries and veins, well, entrance and exit for the arteries and veins to go into and out of your eye. Think about it for a second. If I have a doorway for things to go in and out, let's say an archway, so there's no actual physical door, I can't cover that up if that's supposed to be the way to get in and out of the eye. So having photoreceptors there, having things in the way of that door just doesn't work. That's why it's called the blind spot, because literally the thing that we use to see, the photoreceptors, are not in that spot. So looking at the chambers of the eye, we've got three chambers, the anterior chamber, the posterior chamber, and the vitreous chamber. The anterior chamber is between the cornea and the iris, and it's filled with something called aqueous humor. Aqueous, looks like agua, right? So this is basically the consistency of water. Okay, so let's look at that up close. Maybe. This arch right here is the front of your eye. This is the cornea. This is that glass clear cover to your eye. Here's the iris. You can see it's blue, right? This space right here. This is the anterior chamber and it's filled with something the consistency of water. The second chamber we're going to talk about is the posterior chamber. The posterior chamber is really, really teeny tiny and it's actually between the back of the iris and the front of the lens. It is also filled with aqueous humor, that same consistency of something that's like water. So if you look here, here's the back of the iris. Here's the front of that lens. See this little teeny tiny space here? That is going to be the posterior chamber because it's behind the iris. Now the vitreous chamber. This is the biggest chamber you have in your eye. It goes all the way from the back of the lens to the retina. Okay, so this whole chamber that you see behind the lens is the vitreous chamber. Now, this is actually filled with something called the vitreous humor. The vitreous humor is actually thicker than water. It's almost the consistency of really, really hard jelly. Um, if we were doing like lab, I'm sorry, face to face, you would dissect an eye and you would see that this is kind of solid. It's not as solid as, as, let's say, a gummy bear, but it is solid enough that when you take it out, it'll kind of hold its shape, okay? Now, both of the fluids that you have in your eye, the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor, um, maintain the intraocular pressure. Basically, remember, intra means inside, Ocular means eye. So the intraocular pressure, that pressure inside the eye, literally this vitreous humor that you see here is pushing this forward, pushing this back, pushing this up, pushing this down, keeping your eye round. The aqueous humor that's here is basically helping to keep the lens in place. Up here in the front, this aqueous humor is basically helping the lens out here to also keep its shape. So literally the maintenance of that internal pressure in your eye to keep your eye the proper shape is being controlled by these three chambers being filled with either the aqueous humor or the vitreous humor. The aqueous humor, as I said before, is the consistency of water. If you pour water out of a cup, that's what it looks like. This is basically a substitute blood supply. It provides nutrition for the structures of the anterior eye. So the stuff that you see that's up here is going to be provided with nutrients and wastes are being gotten rid of as well. Earlier when I talked about the cornea, I said it's one of the only parts of the body that can be transplanted without doing tissue typing. 
One of the reasons that you can do that is because instead of having a direct blood supply, it's got this aqueous humor acting as a substitute. Now, something that's kind of interesting, the light has to go through these things. So it refracts light, it bends light. And if you don't believe me, look at this. That background with the stripes going diagonally, at an angle, I guess, it's the same whether it's behind the glass or on the sides of the glass. It's actually still doing the same pattern that you see. But if you look at that pattern in the water, you can see that it's bent. All of a sudden it looks like it's going straight across almost instead of in those diagonal lines. The fluid in your eye does bend light. It helps us to kind of get that bend that we need to focus. Now the vitreous humor. It's like I said, the consistency of jelly. With it being as thick as it is, as viscous as it is, it has a very slow turnover. So if you get floaties in the vitreous humor of your eye, it's going to take months to get rid of them. It's not as quick as, you know, your blood flows and everything just goes back to normal. This again is the thing that holds your lens in place and your retina in place. That pressure, I'm gonna erase this again, that pressure that it's putting backward and pressure that it's putting forward hold these structures, your lens and this whole back of your eye where the retina is in place just by virtue of pressure. If you're in a car accident, let's say you're going forward and your head snaps forward, that vitreous humor kind of like a bottle of water will slosh forward. And if the odds aren't in your favor, your retina will come right off because literally the pressure of this vitreous humor is the only thing holding it in place. So let's talk about the lens, this little thing right here, okay? Changing the shape of the lens um, using the ciliary muscles that we have from um, our ciliary body actually alters how light enters the eye. It allows us to focus light onto one like spot or it'll allow us to spread it out. And its shape will also vary depending on how far or how close something is to your face. So it allows us to finally focus the image on the retina surface. Light entry um, into the eye is regulated also by the iris. The iris, as you know, can either be big or it can be small. It can make this pupil hole bigger or smaller, basically allowing a certain amount of light into the eye, depending on how bright the room is that you're in. So it has to pass through the cornea that's a horrible color to use on white. It has to pass through the cornea. Then it has to pass through the humors. Then it has to pass through the pupil, that hole, um, before it can actually get back here to that retina. Now the retina is responsible for converting the light information into an action potential that can be carried to the brain for interpretation. That's why they're called photoreceptors because photo means light, right? Okay. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum of visible light that we can see. This is the whole entire electromagnetic spectrum, including gamma rays and radio waves, all of that. Our very, very teeny tiny um, visual ability is like right here, okay? From 380 nanometers to about 750 nanometers for the wave size, okay? So visible light is a very short range that your retina can respond to. Um, a couple of terminology terms that you need to know. 
refraction. Light can be bent when it goes from the air into a different medium, into the humors. You saw that with the glass of water. Reflection, when light rays strike an object that isn't transparent and it bounces off its surface and comes back to the eyeball in a specific pattern. Something you have to understand um, is that light and the colors that we see bounce off of the objects that we see in specific patterns. That's how we know what something looks like. A good example of, of reflection would be um, taking, a, taking a mirror and using it to reflect light back at somebody. Focal point. This is the point at which refracted light rays converge in focus by changing the lens's shape. So if you look at the picture on the right here, you'll see this FP here. Okay, I'm going to erase what I just put so that you can see it. That's where those light rays are converging. That's where they're converging before they go on into or onto your retina in the back. In distant vision, when you're looking at something that's far away, okay, that focal point is further back, creating a smaller image. Things that are further away from you look smaller, right? Whereas in near vision, that focal point is actually closer to the front of your eye, closer to the lens, creating a bigger image so that things look closer to you because they're bigger. When you're looking at things that are distant, your lens, um, the ciliary bottle bodies in the muscles, uh, the blah, 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 okay, rewind. The muscles in the ciliary body, there we go, cause the lens to flatten. That's what basically pushes that focal point back toward the back of your eye. However, when you're looking at something closer to your face, the ciliary bodies and the muscles contract. That causes the lens to thicken, which in turn shifts that focal point forward. Um, Three events have to happen to bring an object into focus on your retina. Now we're talking closer than 20 feet, just so you're aware. One is accommodation. The ciliary muscles and the ligaments will start to contract on that lens. There's less tension in the lens, the lens becomes thicker, and there's a greater refraction of light. There's a greater bending of light. Another thing that has to happen is pupil constriction. Your pupils have to get smaller so that you can kind of center the light where it needs to be. You don't want your pupil huge if you're looking at something right in front of your face. Convergence. <clears throat> this has to do with both eyes, and we've all done this to make our eyes look cross-eyed. As something is is brought to your face, both eyes have to look at the one object. So if this is the object that my eyes are looking at, they will turn so that they're both looking in the same direction. That is not the same direction at all, is it? Never claimed I was an artist. So if we're looking forward and our eyes are looking this direction, looking this way, your eyes actually have to kind of turn so that you're both looking in the same direction. That's convergence. Um, it keeps an object in focus with both eyes um, and they have to focus simultaneously. This means the closer the object is to your eyes, they start to rotate medially. They start to rotate toward your nose. So when you were little and you wanted to make your eyes cross, you would look at your finger until you put it on your nose and your eyes would follow. That rotation is what we're talking about when we talk about convergence.